although we've read the whole chapter, we're only going to look at a few verses. And those verses are found in verses 6 through 10. Over the last few weeks, we've looked at the first five. And in them, we've recognized that Jesus prays about his glory and about God's glory. He's praying for himself. But in verses 19, he prays for his disciples who are presently with him. And then from verse 20 to the end of the chapter, he prays for you and me, the people who would come to believe afterward. We're going to look at how Jesus prays for his disciples this morning in these first four verses from 6 through to 10. Jesus is praying for his own people. This may be a, a, an unusual concept to you, but let me explain a little from verse 3. In verse 3, the Lord Jesus states quite specifically, this is eternal life. That is the life that God gives, that, that, that assures us that we're alive now and will live forever. This is eternal life. He's going to define it, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Emphasis on that word, know. Being a Christian is not just being religious. It's not just knowing what the Bible says. It's not just knowing what the church does. Being a Christian is a personal relationship with God. You come through reading the Bible to know that God loves sinners and shows us that love in sending his son to die for us on the cross at Calvary. And then when you understand what Jesus has done on the cross and you, you understand that it wasn't just done for somebody else, it was done for me, you come into a relationship with him. In a very mm, simplistic way, it's like meeting a new friend. If you're in a circumstance where you're now in the company of somebody, you begin talking. Who are you? What do you do? What's your name? And you, you build bridges. And then as you need to spend more time in their company for whatever reason, you get to understand how they tick, how they think. And then somewhere along the line, you make a decision whether you're going to allow that friendship to develop. Now, it's not the best illustration in the world, but it's what Jesus is talking about here. Being a Christian is coming to know God. And what I want to show you this morning is that Jesus, God the Son, is absolutely so concerned for his people that he's praying for us. Let that sink in. Jesus ever lives, says the book of Hebrews, to pray for us, if you know your Bible, to make intercession for us. So if you ask yourself, what is Jesus doing right now? I can tell you at least one thing. He's praying. That I'll be able to communicate to you, that you'll be able to hear. But that's not the end of the story. Because when you make a new friendship, it changes how you live, doesn't it? If you're going to spend time with them, if you're going to... Um, enjoy their company, then you, you bend and shape so that you fit together. That's exactly what Jesus is praying about. Now, I, I'm going to go through these four verses and explain to you and suggest to you how they should work. I do it by forming three subheadings. My sermon is, I forgot to give you the title, Jesus prays for his own, and then I'm going to say that he prays for us because we are God's gift to him. He prays for us because we are now in the place where we have to glorify God. And he prays for us because we're always in danger. We're always being pressurized to throw in the towel. If I stick with simple pictures. Prone to wander, says my favorite hymn. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, oh, take and seal it. 
seal it from your courts above. That's my prayer. And it parallels Jesus' prayer that we will be kept to the very end. Let me draw your attention to verses 6, 7, and 8 because they stand together as a unit. I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you have given me. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. And they have believed that you sent me. So we have here this very important biblical teaching. The while all of mankind has turned its back on God... And has no time for him. That's why the psalmist calls him a fool, isn't it? Psalm 14 and Psalm 53 both begin the same way. The fool has said in his heart, in the inside, no God for me. Or there is no God, as the English translation puts it. We don't look down on them because of that. It brings out pity and compassion towards them. Because we want them to come to know God as we've been privileged to do so. Now what Jesus is referring to is that though all mankind are on a crash course for eternal judgment, God has actually identified and selected from mankind a people for his name. It's what's called the biblical doctrine of election. It wasn't that they were any better than anybody. It wasn't that they would do more than some others. It wasn't because in some way or other, they would be the best of a bad law. The fact is, we're all a bad law, according to the Bible. It was out of his own pleasure. God is the only being that exists who can do things impartially. So it's not like you and me. When we make friends, we pick who we're going to make friends with, don't we? And we soon avoid people that we decide to have no dealings with. But God has chosen the people who are sinful by habit and practice. And he has made provision so that they can live with him forever. Go back to the verses. Jesus says, I have manifested your name. That big word manifested means opened up. It means revealed. I've shown them who you are and what they're like. And with the disciples, that had been going on for three years. They were slow learners, if you know anything about them. So be encouraged. You don't have to understand all this in the click of your fingers. There's much to learn, a great deal to know. But here they are. They deserve to be left to their own choices. But God in mercy has decided to deliver this people for his own name. And how does he do it? He does it through Jesus. Because there has never been a human being in history who is 100% good. Now, if you measure yourself by other people, if you sort of drop alongside me, you might be able to say, I'm better than you aren't. And if you ask my wife, there's lots of um, opportunity for that to be true. But the fact is, God says, you need to measure yourself by Jesus. You need to look at him and recognize how absolutely perfect he is, was, and always will be. And God's standard for having people in heaven is that they need to be like Jesus. And that's the beauty of the gospel. I have manifested your name. When the Bible uses the word name, it's not just his title. All the way through the Bible, it would be a sermon on its own. The name of God means the character, the person. It means Who God is, what God likes, dislikes, everything. Everything he's done. The acts of mercy, the acts of judgment. Jesus says, I've shown them who you are. And remember, everlasting life is knowing God. How do we get to know God? Jesus 
shows us who he, has, who he is. He is the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He's the God who doesn't want mankind to perish. And to stop that happening, he says, I'm going to intervene on behalf of these people that I've chosen. How am I going to do it? That's where we go back to the Bible. Jesus says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me. So here is the doctrine of election in a nutshell. It's not just that some people are chosen to be saved. The doctrine teaches that God has given people to Jesus. And having given them to us, he took on board responsibility to change us. And he does that by manifesting God's name, yes, but also glorifying God. Back earlier on, he says, um, I have glorified you on the earth, verse 4. What he's talking about is that as he's been going about for three years, he's been telling people who God is and what he's like. And he's also shown them through the many miracles that he did. People who were in desperate conditions, sick, blind, poor, trapped in sin. Jesus changed their lives. And that's what he means. He, he showed the world that the God who is the God of heaven and earth is good. That's one of the historical debates. Right back at the beginning of the Bible, you get the story of Adam and Eve. And in that story, you get Satan messing with Eve's mind. And the way he does that, he says to him, very underhandly, God really isn't good. He says to them, you can't trust God. It was all about whether they should eat from a certain tree. And, and, and Satan says in, to Eve and into her mind, God's keeping something from you. And if you had it, you would be like him. And then, of course, she ate and she, the effect of that has touched all of our lives. We're all like Eve. We're all questioning whether God is good or not. And the, the teaching here is so important because what it establishes is the incredible goodness of God. Imagine for a minute. One of your children went off the rails. I know you never did. You were a perfect child. But imagine for a minute. And they did something which was really terrible. I don't want to describe anything. But go with me in the generalization. And they upset you by doing it. What would you do with them? Well, you have a choice. You can throw them out. Say, get on with it. You made the mess. Live in it. Or you can say, I love you. I want you to still be in a relationship with me. Come on home and we'll fix this. Now again, my illustrations are very poor, but that's a picture of who God is and what he's done for us. Because all of us are rebels at heart. Go on, show me I'm wrong. But don't you always tend to look after number one? If it doesn't suit me, it doesn't suit anybody. And we're rebels against God. We've turned our back on him. God says, this is how you should live. And you say, yeah, I'll make up my own mind. The fact that we're rebels is evident all around us. If you've driven here this morning, you've come through various speed limits. What do you do when you move from 30 miles to 40 and as you come from Pickering to Middleton? Do you just gently increase the speed or do you go, wow, I can go faster now. And if nobody's looking, nobody knows, but wait just now, somebody does. You see, that rebels in us. You get on the open road and you've got a powerful vehicle or motorcycle and you, you say, let, let, let's see how good it can go. And you know that you're breaking the law. 
That's a picture of who we are as human beings. And as such, you know fine well, if you break the law, you are liable to the penalty. You might go and get a nice judge who gives, it, gives you a soft penalty, but nonetheless, you're liable to the penalty. Well, God has given us his law. They're called the Ten Commandments. And they're quite important. He says, first and foremost, you must worship God and only God. I tell you, I never get past that one. We get so many other things we want to worship. Then he tells you, you shall not take his name in vain. Very broadly, that means you must never use, or use God as a swear word or Jesus as a swear word. There's a lot more to it than that, but that's probably where we cross the boundary. And then he says, you will always remember to gather to worship with me. In the Old Testament, it's called the Sabbath. In the Christian church, we worship on a Sunday. And then he says, you shall not steal. You shall not tell lies. You've always to obey your parents. You won't covet. You won't commit adultery. And you might be able to tick some of them off, but I defy you to tick them all off. Who hasn't told a lie? Who hasn't pinched something? Isn't it nice how we change the word? It's not stealing. It's just pinching. And who among us ever did everything our parents said? So just with those threes, that makes you a lying, thieving, disobedient person. And so when you see God's law, it says you're a rebel and you're under judgment. And you feel the judgment unless somebody else takes your place. You can just imagine the picture in a court of law where you're in the dock and you hear the judge saying guilty. And then he takes his wig off and his gavel, puts it down and steps out of the, 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 the judge's seat. The word escapes me. It, out of the judge's seat. And he says, I'm now going to pay your fine. That would be astounding, wouldn't it? But that's what God did. And that's what's being explained here. You see, he says... I have manifested your name, your character, who you are. This God who loves so much that he will actually sacrifice what is most precious to him so that you can become a Christian. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Notice that little phrase, kept your word. It's important. God speaks to us through his word, which is the Bible. The Holy Spirit was responsible for writing this book. And the Holy Spirit then uses God's work to change us on the inside. It says in one part of the Bible that the word of God is sharp and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. It's so powerful. And when a person becomes a Christian, what happens is they, they don't just read the book. They hear God speaking in it, and they feel the need to have their sin removed, to have the penalty taken away, and to be set free. So when Jesus looks at his followers, he defines them like this. They have kept your word. That means that they've heard me speaking, and they are now living as I would have them to live. Way further on, I don't think I'm going to get this far this morning, but look, look what he says in verse 10. And all mine are yours and yours are mine. That's selection again. And I am glorified in them. That word glorified, we, we spent a, a whole part of last week just thinking about it, means God's goodness, grace, and mercy is seen in them. And if you know anything about your Bible, you'll know that when Jesus began his life of preaching and teaching, there were two fishermen who just gave up everything, their business and their life's work, to follow him. They glorified God because they heard about God's love for them. They heard about God's provision to deal with their sin, and they made it their business to live with Jesus. And in that sense, they glorify him. They, they, they make him stand out. 
I'm resisting going down every one of the disciples, but if you've got time, follow the pattern. And, and it's not just way back then. When a person becomes a Christian, and please notice, you need to become a Christian. You're not a Christian because you were brought up in England any more than you would become a car by sitting in a garage. The only way to become a Christian, according to the Bible, is a phrase that gets dragged through the mud. It's called being born again. And it describes that spiritual change where God's word, the Bible, is applied on the inside by the Holy Spirit. And he gives you now a change of outlook, a different way of living. And so when you're born again, you enter God's kingdom. He is now your king. That's what's involved in being in a kingdom, isn't it? He's now your Lord and master. They have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you have given me. And notice the next little phrase because it describes it again. And they have received them. Back at the beginning of John's gospel. To as many as received him, he gave the power to become children of God. This, dear friends, is the biblical doctrine of election. I know Christians struggle with it. But it's not just that God has sort of ticked the box for some and dumped the rest. It is the most incredible expression of his love. Whereby instead of allowing us to get what we deserve, he's chosen to deliver us and to make us his people. When Jesus died on the cross... He paid the price, the penalty, for your admission into the kingdom of God. So that you don't actually contribute anything to it. It is, in Paul's language, God's free gift. And what do you do with the free gift? You receive it, don't you? You receive it. To not receive it, is in fact to offend the giver. And that's the, the, if I can use the language, the terror of the gospel. Many people think that they have to clean up their act and behave in a certain way so that God will like them. I'm telling you now, you'll never make it. There is only one thing you need to do to become a Christian, and that's to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's the one that's paid the price. And he's the only one that will bring you to glory. And the Bible is quite clear. If you refuse to trust Jesus, not only is it the daftest thing you've ever done, it's an offense to God. It's as if you're saying to God, I don't care that you love me. I don't care what you've done to save me. I'm going to live my own life. Well, says God, that's what you want. Get on with it. But you know there's a price to be paid at the end. I thank God for the day when God's word came alive. Turned me from my madness. That's what the Bible calls sin. And set me on the highway of holiness to heaven itself. You see, these words are absolutely profoundly Important. It's profoundly important. And you and I need to have them functioning in our life day after day. To see yourself, if you're a Christian, as God's gift to Jesus. Have you ever thought about yourself like that? It was in one of my books this week and it made me sit up. We often think about Jesus as God's gift to us. But if I've understood this passage at all, you, me, every true believer, have been handed over to Jesus. And we belong to him. 
There's an old hymn, isn't there? Now I belong to Jesus. Trouble is, we sing so many hymns and never think what they're saying. Now I belong to Jesus. And therefore, if I belong to him, therefore, it, it's going to influence who I am, what I do, and where my priorities lie. And it's at this point we need to say to people that are not Christians, if you don't belong to Jesus, when it comes to the final day when you meet him, there'll be no welcome. I hesitate even to say it, but that's how the Bible teaches us. No welcome. If you want to receive what God has provided, then you cannot live with God forever in heaven. So it's vitally urgent that we impress upon Christians that they are God's gift to Jesus and to non-Christians that they need to be part of God's gift to Jesus. And here's the incredible truth about the Bible and election. How do you find out if you're elect? It's quite simple. It's how you respond to Jesus' free offer of salvation. Nobody has an E stamped on their forehead. And so as a preacher, my job is to tell you, the Bible says, that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And how you respond to that tells you which camp you're in. The Bible says, come to me, all you who labor under heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, by implication, if you don't come to Jesus, there's no rest. Over and over in the Bible, down through history, this message has rung forth and changed men and women's lives. And if you're not a Christian, it's a tragedy to miss that. It's a tragedy for life now and for life forever. You really are slapping God in the face. But it can change in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. I remember the very day that it happened to me. Some people, it's very gentle uh, and quiet. But I remember in the town of Dunfermline, most of you won't even know where that is. In the street called Chamberfield Road, number 2A, I think it was. My wife likes to keep me correct. I had come home from work in the middle of the afternoon and I was, I had begun a correspondence course and I had the results to my answers to the questions sent back to me and my tutor had just written at the bottom of the page, you seem to know a lot about Christianity. Have you ever received Jesus as your Lord and Saviour? I don't know what happened, but in a moment, I knew what I had to do. And that's where God changed this old bag of bones. 54, 53 years ago it will be. I've not gone perfectly since then. But I'll tell you what, God's love is perfect. It never lets you go. He keeps me. He brings me. And that's the glory of what's happening in these verses. And I want you to see then just briefly in these last moments what I would have said from verse 10 and verse 9. I want to take them in reverse order. Jesus acknowledges, you see, this link between him and the Father. And all mine are yours and yours are mine. And here it is again. And I am glorified in them. That word glory, glorified, is all the way through the passage. It will come up again. But it's a, a reminder that when God in his kindness is pleased to deliver you from sin and judgment, it shows in the life that you live. A ridiculous idea. Supposing you went to the bank tomorrow and found that somebody had put 5,000 pounds in there. 
what would your face do? I almost guarantee there'd be a smile from ear to ear. A little twig of conscience would come and say, is it really mine? Can I have it? Should I keep it? Should I find out? I hope you're honest enough to explore all of them. But if it comes back that it's legitimately given there freely for you, it would change how you lived. In these day and ages, it wouldn't change it for very long. It doesn't go so far. But it would change how you lived. That would mean you were glorifying the giver. That you were actually showing how much you appreciate. And that's what Jesus is saying here. They've already glorified me. And you'll find later in the chapter, he prays that they will go on glorifying me. In the Christian world, that's the doctrine of sanctification. It's not that God gives us a new book of rules and says, right, you rotten lot, I've saved you, you didn't deserve it, and I know you'll never be any better. Now do this. No, that's not Christianity. Christianity is the love that will not let us go. Being a Christian is the response of a heart that knows that it's loved and wants to live. I met a young lass once, almost by accident. I was in the Merchant Navy, far away Australia at one point. And my cousin contacted me to see whether I would be best man at his wedding. You don't say no to your favourite cousin. And I came home and wow, the, the, the what's the name? The, the bride's. No, not the bridesmaid. What's she called? Lady in waiting? No, that's not coming either. What's the word, Catherine? Bridesmaid. I was right the first time. She caught my attention. From their relationship developed. And almost a year later to the day, we were man and wife. Sorry for embarrassing you, lass. I'm trying to explain this profound. And she has changed my life immensely. I was a rough and ready scallywag. And she keeps me clean, well fed and looked after. And she tells me when I'm going wrong. And when she tells me, I don't say, oh, you're not allowed to tell me. I know she loves me. And she wants it for my best. And that's, for me... One of God's picture of what it means to be a Christian. It's a relationship. This is eternal life. This is what it's like to be a Christian. Knowing you. Being known by you. And living for your glory. Are you feeling the weight of it? I'm just about crushed under the very idea. But then go back to verse 9. That's why I kept it till last. I... Pray for them. That's the most encouraging. Nah. That's another one of the encouraging things in the passage. I'm not left to do this on my own. I have a savior in heaven who's already established how much he loves me. Personally looking after me day after day after day. You say, but how can he? he? He was only one person. No, he's God. And as God, he's come to dwell with us in the person of the Holy Spirit. So there's never a day nor a moment in my life when I'm left to get on with it on my own. And I know he's working all things together for good, says another verse. To them that love him. Takes a bit of swallowing at times because you wonder why, why, why. You come back and you say, I know God is good. I'm not going to believe Satan's lie. I'm going to seek to live for his glory. Friends, that's the beauty of the gospel. I hope I've explained it clearly enough. So that as you look into your spiritual bank account, the joy of being a Christian will be almost uncontrollable. You should see the serious faces I'm looking on right now. 
Really? Jesus says, my joy I leave with you. Doesn't he? Chapter 16, and was it verse 33? No, I've got it from somewhere else. My joy I leave with you. And it's the reason that as Christians, we can, in fact, skip even when the world is screwed up. I pray that you know that joy, Christian. But I plead with any who are not Christians to, to recognize that this very day, it says in the Bible, today if you hear his voice, this very day is the day when you can come into the benefits of what Jesus has done. And I long to hear that that's exactly what God's done for you. Don't wait. Don't put off. Because your tomorrow and God's today will never meet otherwise. Today. Trust him. And commit to following him. For the rest of the days of your life. Amen. Oh, we're going to finish by singing. 832, which I thought was a, a good way of expressing a, a, an appropriate response to this incredible truth that God hasn't left us, abandoned us to our sin, but has chosen to save us. 832, to him we come, Jesus Christ our Lord, God's own living word, his dear son, in him there is no east and west. In him all nations shall be blessed. To all he offers peace and rest. Loving Lord. 832. <laughs>
Till at the last with joy we'll see Jesus in glorious majesty Live with him through eternity Our great God and Saviour, we thank you for the gospel of your dear Son. We bless you that it was your pleasure to choose us in Christ, and we rejoice in the privilege that's been given to us. Give us the grace, O Lord, to live, to glorify you, day after day, in Jesus' name. Amen.